Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday video. This one will be a bit shorter, I would assume. Sometimes I say that I end up just talking for a long time, but I don't have a script. I don't have a video that I'm reacting to that gives some guidelines. I don't have any AI art to keep you entertained. It is just me sitting down wanting to talk about a particular topic, which is what these Sunday videos were always intended to do. And that is the appeal to majority. This is something that has been coming up constantly in the comments since I first started, whether it is from believers, whether it is from people on the fence, or even atheists that are reconsidering something or making a claim for something else, we are all extremely susceptible to this very common logical fallacy, the appeal to majority. So how do I often see it play out amongst Christians? A variety of ways. Brandon, you know, I am doubting and there are some issues with the Bible, but come on, everyone I know believes this stuff. But come on, all the people in my church, all the people that have had near-death experiences, all the people that used to have drug addictions and they became Christians and now they don't. Look how many Christians there are in general. There's more Christians than adherence to any other religion. Look how far back Christianity goes. This thing's thousands of years old. You really think you know better? Of course Jesus was raised from the dead, over 500 people said they saw it. The Bible in general is the most prolific book of all time. Jesus is mentioned as a historical figure in other historical writings more than anyone else. And I could go on and on and on. And some of those are just A, simply not true, B, have not been fully understood, or C, are suffering from some sort of other issue or logical fallacy, like the example with the 500. We don't have 500 people making that claim. We have one claim. It says that in the Bible one time by one person. So that's one not 500, right? That's just an example where if you don't slow things down and back people up and help them zoom out, when you let all these things run amok in your mind unchecked and without some logic or rationality to corral them, you can get yourself into a pretty serious belief. So as the goal of this channel is to help people who are trying to deconstruct or deconvert from Christianity to let go of some of these things, but also to help people understand how to think more critically and be more rational and Logical, this seems like a perfect topic to talk about. Granted, I don't think there's that much to say, but whatever can be said, I think needs to be said. So I think a way that we can do this is to go through some of the things that I just mentioned, break them down one by one, talk about why maybe that doesn't make a lot of sense. We'll see if any other excuses come to my mind or anything else that I've heard from you guys. But let's start with, look how many Christians there are. I understand this. And by the way, a ton of you watching this, especially you ardent atheist, are just going to be like, what a dumb reason to believe anything. To give the Christian the benefit of the doubt, I don't think that it is a statement like this, look how many Christians there are, or there's more Christians than anyone else of any other kind of belief system that makes them say, okay, Christianity must be true, therefore I will convert to Christianity. I don't think that. I think the reality is we have a whole host of things working on us. We have a litany of psychological conditions that are getting us to agree or arrive at some concluded point. We desperately want to fit in. That is a human desire. No one wants to be the odd man out. And so if you are born into a culture, into a time and place where one particular religion is very common, that already is an appeal to majority in and of itself. Your surroundings. Now, it's going to lead to a bunch of other things. It's going to lead to indoctrination. It's going to lead to confirmation bias and many other things that are going to assist it. But you're in. And so that first appeal to majority seems to be how many people around you also believe it. So I'm mixing some of my examples already about, well, everyone around me seems to believe this. And after all, Christianity is the most popular religion of the entire world. But so what? So what? Really? Why does that matter? And for some of you, this will be a wake up because I had moments like this where I finally either thought of something for the first time or allowed myself to really realize something for the first time. And again, for others of you, this is extremely basic. What if you were born in a Muslim country? Christianity would not only be not common, it would be a sin. It would be incorrect. It would be false. What if you were born in a different time when Christianity was not as popular? 2000 years ago, Christianity was the new kid on the block. It was some weird offshoot and cult of some claimed Messiah from a root of Judaism, which was much larger than Christianity at this time. Did that mean that 2,000 years ago, if we're using the appeal to majority, that Judaism was more true than Christianity? 2,000 years ago, Islam had not even emerged yet. So there goes our number one and our number two religions today. 2,000 years ago, barely existed and didn't exist at all. Hinduism, however, would have been a 
founding as a religion that existed centuries before these and had much higher numbers. So when Jesus was born, was Hinduism the correct religion? But as soon as we got enough adherence to follow Jesus, that immediately became true, right? If that logic clearly doesn't add up, then an appeal to majority of any kind at any point is utterly useless. I think it's important to distinguish that just because something is a logical fallacy doesn't mean it's untrue, but using something that is a logical fallacy as any amount of evidence whatsoever does not help it become any more true. And if something is not true, it doesn't just all of a sudden make it so. Hopefully that made sense. Again, I'm mixing around all of my examples already because now I've covered that Hinduism was actually more popular and around before these other religions. So if Hinduism was at one point the most popular, and that was true, and it makes claims that are mutually exclusive from the claims of Christianity. How can something transfer from one truth to another if they're mutually exclusive simply because of the appeal to that majority? It can't. It doesn't make sense, so it falls down, so it's worthless as an argument. Just because you've been born into a time and place where this is what is common for you means nothing except that you were born into a time and place where this was common. There are times in history where no one had ever heard of Yahweh, period, where no one was a Jew, where no one was a Christian. And during those times, people still believed in other gods and other religions. Despite however much you would like to argue that, or whatever young earth version of creation you believe, those are hard, cold facts. That to me is so very telling. You know what else it probably also predicts? That in the future, we will have gods and religions that take the place of our current gods and religions like Allah and Yahweh and Krishna, etc. Those might all fade to the past. Things that people once believed way back when, how silly. Now we have these real gods. Now we have these real religions. And those people in the future will be as equally incorrect as you are right now making the same claims about your god, your religion. Just like the people in the past were equally wrong for the gods and religions they believed in well before yours even showed up as a potential on the scene. What this shows me so very clearly is exactly how man-made religion is, which is exactly why an appeal to majority is ridiculous. And if you want to see some better examples of this, you can look at two of these videos here. 10 other gods other than Yahweh, 10 other wisdom books other than Proverbs. There was a whole lot else going on on this earth before, during, and after Jesus. He is a small part of the lore and mythologies that human existence has created. That's it. It's really that simple. It seems big now. It is big now. We're at 2.3 billion Christians. That includes, though, a whole lot of different denominations. And when I hear Christians argue amongst themselves, whether it's traditional versus conservative or Protestants versus Catholics and on and on and on, you could break those down and all of a sudden you're probably not in a majority anymore. If you're a Protestant who believes that the Catholics have it incorrect, you just lost out on being in the number one religion. And Islam is not far behind. That's 1.8 billion. I believe on most recent studies. And guess what? Islam is growing faster than Christianity. Christianity is actually declining. That means most likely if things don't change, we will have a moment when there are more Muslims on this earth breathing and living than there are Christians. Uh-oh, did Islam just all of a sudden become true? If that wouldn't make Islam immediately become true, you in the comment section saying, there's more Christians than any other belief that's gotta mean something are immediately proven incorrect. Again, I know it seems basic, but it is really something that escapes a lot of people who have been fully indoctrinated and have been hearing these kinds of reasons and excuses their entire life. It may not be the thing that makes you believe, but it's the thing that helps you continue to believe, right? I get that. I really, really do. So what were some of the other examples that I see often? The Bible is the best-selling book of all time. There's never been a book or collection of books that has had this much impact ever. There's never been a holy or religious book where we have so many copies. One of the ways you can see this fall flat on its face is I recently watched the debate between Matt Dillahunty and Cliff. Now I don't remember. I know it's not Nectal like I thought it was, but Connecty, I, I'm so sorry, Cliff. I am not trying to butcher your last name. But in that video, Cliff is trying to make the claim about the validity of what we can know about Jesus based off how many ancient copies we have of the New Testament gospels, etc. And as Matt rightfully and obviously points out, all that proves is that a lot of people believed and believed enough to write down and make a lot of copies. It doesn't prove 
anything else. But without a voice of reason, without some objectivity coming in, it is so easy just to get this and let the layers pile on top of themselves until you just believe that it means so much. There are understandable reasons why a particular religion might be more popular, why a particular holy book might circulate better. Some of it might come down to what is in the message. If one of the biggest messages of that religion is to share that religion, and if there's a carrot and stick to drive that religion, then that religion is more likely, it's like its like watching evolution play out, that one is more likely to pass on and make copies of itself. Right now in the world, one of the most peaceful religions is Jainism. There's only 4 million people that still believe this, or Jainism. 4 million versus, what did I say, 2.3 billion? But Jainism doesn't have any big carrot or stick. It doesn't have a great commission that tells you to go out into all the world. It hasn't been spread at the tip of the sword. It hasn't been used to conquer and create empires. And so it remains in its little corner of the world with its small amount of adherence, even though it is an obviously better belief system. It might be equally untrue for some of its larger spiritual claims, but in terms of a philosophy, it is much more beneficial. That doesn't always mean it spreads. So again, there are real human, psychological, sociological, economical, reasons that Christianity has become so dominant. One of those reasons that people don't like to look at is when this country was being formed, there was a profound amount of believers, and they did one of a few things. They converted the natives with this belief system, and those who would not convert were often killed or left to die, or segregated. Then we brought over an entire group of enslaved people, and we gave and forced on them our religion, and it became their religion, still passed down to this day. And we've seen this done in other countries in other times. And you force everyone to believe what you want them to believe on penalty of death or segregation, and you enslave people and force into them this religion and give them edited, redacted copies of a Bible, a slave Bible, so that they will believe. And then that gets passed down even once those people are free etc. Like, of course, so many people in America for so long have believed. There wasn't another option. And now that even there are options, people get stuck. And I think that that's something that we should address really quick. There's an illusion of freedom. Oh, well, we live in America, and America, constitutionally speaking, is a secular nation, and we offer the freedom of religion. And that's amazing. And for many people, it has allowed them to practice a religion that goes against the status quo. And that's great, because not all countries have that. And I'm not going to dog on that. But it doesn't mean that for a vast majority of this country's time, you couldn't prosper without adhering to the current belief system. Still to this day, we cannot have a president that says they don't believe in God. They will not get elected. That might change in the future, but that is still something happening in 2023. The God of the Bible is so ingrained into this country's history that it has been beyond advantageous for members of this country to believe in this God for the most part, for most of the time. There are exceptions to that rule. The internet is another great example of this. The internet should offer and has offered many people an opportunity to see outside of their current view. I don't know if if without the internet, I would have ever left the religion. I was so indoctrinated, so ingrained, stuck in such an echo chamber of like-minded believers, my school, my church, my friends, my parents, their friends, their kids, babysitters, daycare workers, Sunday school, chapel at normal school, Bible classes in normal school, etc. Eventually, on the internet, I saw things I had no idea existed, arguments I had never heard, realities about the Bible that I simply didn't find on my own or had been able to ignore with the help help of my community. But the internet can also work to enhance the concept that everyone else believes like this, because you can go find exactly what you want to find. And this happens with atheists too. We can get ourselves in echo chambers. We can have confirmation bias that plays into what we are predispositioned to already believe, or even what we want to believe. I think it happens a lot less when you consider the nature of an atheist is someone who is doubting, but it can still happen. So I'm not saying, oh, Christians are the stupid ones who always fall prey to these traps. No, but it is important for the believer to do the things that the religion says to do. And many of those are to continue to allow the person to believe in that religion. I mean, the Bible has in the Old Testament people killing people that introduced doubt or another God, right? We know we're supposed to be equally yoked. We know we're supposed to raise up our children in the way of God so that they believe in their older years. We know that we're supposed to put ourselves in fellowship with other believers. All of those are calls to action that reinforce the power of an appeal to majority. We 
talked about claims within the Bible that are appeals to majority themselves. And some of these are like the 500, but there's other parts of the Bible, even having four gospels that relatively say the same thing as Christians would put it. Oh, there's some minor differences, but nothing really. We have four different accounts by four eyewitnesses about Jesus. Look at all this proof. Well, they're not eyewitnesses. They're anonymous. They're decades after the fact, but we don't need to get into all of that. In fact, there's a heck of a lot more than four Gospels. Four seems like a lot compared to, say, one when you just hear a story about someone. But what if I told you there was over 50 Gospels that were written, but only four that agreed even to the degree that they do, and so only four that got canonized? And the reason, by the way, for why why those four got canonized is ridiculous, but we'll talk about that when we do our canonization videos. Or I should say why only four got canonized. But 50, that's great. That should even help further with an appeal to majority. So why don't we use all 50? Because they don't agree, because they're straight up contradicting, because some of them show Jesus in a horrible light, because some of them are obviously fraudulent. And so we took a fact that a lot of people throughout a lot of different time wrote their account of what they had heard about the Jesus story. And we said, we want more than one, but we also want it to be impactful. So we're going to take four and we're going to say, look, four different accounts where we can rely on the testimony. And that is an appeal to majority. And it is a created one. It is a curated one. That seems highly problematic to me. So yeah, sometimes we do it for very specific claims like the resurrection of Jesus. Sometimes we do it for things that are more vague. When I made my heaven video, the number one response I got that I cannot be right and that heaven indeed must exist and is good was because of the amount of near-death experiences where people have described almost dying and then seeing heaven. Now, this isn't a video to talk about near-death experience, but people use the near-death experience claim incorrectly by applying an appeal to majority to it. And it's that very appeal that should show just how ridiculous this claim is in the first place. Let me explain. Many, 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 many people have had near-death experiences. There is obviously for some people, some of the times as their body thinks that it is dying or specifically their brain thinks that it is dying, it provides something. Is this just DMT being released that is naturally found in a part of our brain that gets activated during its final death throes? Maybe. Is it a severe amount of psychological stress and trauma playing out similar to a dream fashion and working off of our unconscious or most deeply rooted beliefs, perhaps? It seems like those and other suggestions like those make a lot more sense than God is real. And if you get close enough to dying, even though he has the foreknowledge to know that you are not going to die, he will give you a glimpse both of heaven and hell, since we have near-death experiences of both, showing you where you're going and what it's like. Doesn't make much sense for God to do this. He won't even reach out and help me, who has desperately begged when I thought I was going to lose everything, my identity, my family, etc., as I was starting to doubt him for him to show up and didn't, but he'll just give Billy Bob an experience of heaven to fill him up when he had his heart attack. So I'm getting off point, but even if God is doing near-death experiences, why? And even if near-death experiences are true and we need to take them as such instead of some psychological effect, we have a new problem, just like religion. We have people who have near-death experiences and they see the Islamic heaven and hell or the Hindu heaven or hell or the Norse heaven or hell, typically the one that they grew up believing in. How convenient. So if near-death experiences and the mass amount that they have are supposed to mean anything, the very fact, like religion, that they do not all agree proves that they cannot be taken as any kind of evidence. If we had verifiable evidence that every single time someone almost died, they all had the exact same vision of the exact same God and parameters of that God's purported heaven or hell, that would be something. We have nothing like that. So, this is obviously turning out longer. I did end up talking about near-death experiences. I am not doing a very good job being on point, but hopefully you are finding this at least entertaining or hopefully insightful and educational. So what else do I hear a lot of in the comments that is some kind of an appeal to majority? Let's try to think of one more. Ah, well, I hear this all the time and this just fundamentally isn't true, but people try to talk about from a historical figure, we have no one more popular than Jesus. Now there's a few ways that this claim is made or I have seen 
be made. One is just that simply that, hey, he's really popular. Like, yeah, people know about Caesar and Benjamin Franklin, but more people know about Jesus than any other name. It's actually not true. I recently saw a top 10 list and I want to say Jesus was number seven and like Muhammad was number three. And it had to do with the internet. And there were parameters like by YouTuber or by age demographic, etc. But I think the overall popularity of a person's online identity, if you will, is how this was ranked. Now, again, that's just one way to rank it. And it's not its own form of evidence. I'm just saying that you can get a lot of answers that aren't Jesus by how you phrase the question or what sources you are using. I would like to see some actual evidence in general that Jesus is the most popular historical figure ever. Fine. Let's say we get that evidence. Does it mean that he and all of his claims are true? Maybe he did exist. He's obviously had a huge impact or his lore has. That's no different than the Bible being very popular or Christianity being a really popular religion. It doesn't mean anything about the actual claim of the validity in and of itself. But I've also heard people try to say he's the most documented historical figure. And that is just simply not true. For a fact, we can do a whole video about that. But even if he was right? That's the whole point of this. Let's give you the majority that you want, even though most of the time you're incorrect or you're using some other fallacy to get yourself there. Even if he is hands down the most popular, the most written about, the one that has actually done the most good in the world, let's just throw that one on there, that nothing else heals addicts better than turning towards Jesus, that nothing else heals marriages more than Jesus or a belief in Jesus or a belief in Christianity, right? You can say, whatever you want. You can have all of these true facts if they were indeed true, and it wouldn't make this religion true. It wouldn't mean he actually exists. It wouldn't mean he actually died and was raised from the dead. It would just mean that the belief in that system as a byproduct can produce these other sometimes desirable, sometimes also very non-desirable outcomes. That's it. And if you don't believe me, look at this in history. The Stoics really got a hold of lust and gluttony and drunkenness. They really reined it in. It was a wonderful tool because it created virtue ethics and it created a desire and a popularity for self-discipline. Does that mean that any gods that the Stoics believed in when they said it was so important to show this to Apollo or for the sake of the logos or providence or fortune, we do these things? Not all of them believed, but many of them did believe. Does that make their gods or their religions true simply because they were able to identify certain desirable behaviors and get them to happen more on average for that populace that also believed in the same things? No, it just doesn't. It doesn't do what you want it to do for you. And if it did, you'd have to give that over to everything else. You can believe whatever you want. There are billions of Muslims who are good people, who are charitable, who help their neighbors. Does that mean all of a sudden that because of that huge influx of people who identify as Muslim doing something good, that it's just true? No. There's a whole other argument to be made for Hey, if humanity just is incapable of not having a belief in religion, which religion happens to be the most beneficial, lines up with the best moral ethics that we can then say, well, we would be lost without it and it's better to go ahead and fake a belief in this or just assume or guess since we can't know. Fine. That's like a very Jordan Peterson-like conversation and you can have that, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I see constantly are people who just can't get over the fact. They can't, despite all the evidence of how harmful the Bible is, how contradicting it is, how God has failed in his promises, how the Holy Spirit has not revealed truth to everyone as advertised, etc. All of these claims that have fallen flat, that people know better than, they can't quite let go because my whole family believes. Everyone around me believes. So many people believe. Look at how popular it is. Look at this Bible. Look at the good that's come from it. Look at how many people give to charity. Look at the studies that say it actually helps you live a better life. Blah, 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 blah. All of it doesn't make it true. That's it. That's the whole point. And some of those things do a slightly better job than others, if others do at all, at pointing to maybe it being beneficial, maybe certain parts of certain claims being actualized. But on a whole, that a God exists in general, that he sent his son who became human and died and rose again to atone for our sins, these kinds of spiritual supernatural claims, it does nothing for, nothing at all. So I wanted to have kind of a foundational video on appeal to majority so that as these things which continue to keep coming up, I can say, hey, 
over here. So thanks for bearing with me on this diatribe. I hope you enjoyed this week's videos. Tuesday, we talked about Dennis Prager and Ben Shapiro and did a reaction to them. Thursday, we did Song of Songs, which I think was really interesting. Go and watch that if you missed that one. And then on Friday, I posted my conversation with Trent Horn. So that one's longer, but next time you go for a run or a workout or a long drive, go ahead and throw that on if you would. Thanks so much for being here. I have no idea what we're going to be putting out for content this week, but as always, there will be a Tuesday, Thursday, Sunday video. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my Iconoclist, GVI, Jacob, Jason, Oliver, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, and my atheist advocates, Anne, Elijah, Roquette, and Sparky, as well as all my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in this mission or just enjoy watching the content, please consider joining these fine patrons in supporting the channel. Thanks and have a great day.